Uh, you never know when you gather like this what God might say, what he might do. And I want to talk with you in these next few moments. We're focusing on prayer. I want to talk to you especially about the influence of your prayer life. Um, I suppose one of the things I hear more than anything else when I um, travel around and speak and meet with God's people is I'll have these dear people come to me and say, I have a heart for prayer. I know it's important. I know it's the most important thing that we do. Then they'll say, but I can't get people to want to pray with me. I can't get my church to want to pray. We hold a prayer meeting and no one comes. We, have you heard any of that? Have you, have you experienced any of that? Uh, or my husband says, well, you're the prayer in our home, and so you, I'm counting on you to do the praying. Um, and there are many lonely prayers out there across America today who say, I know that it's the most important thing. I know that when we pray, we talk to Almighty God, uh, and he can, in a moment, create a universe. And prayer lets us commune with that God. Uh, and yet, I can't convince anyone else that it's something that they would, should try doing themselves. Isn't that sort of, does that not seem ironic in some sense? It's the most important thing you could do, and yet it's hard to get people to want to do it. It's, it's, it's the most exciting thing you could do. If, if you suddenly got an invitation to go to the White House and meet with uh, national leaders and the president, regardless of your political persuasion, you probably would say, that'd be, that'd be awesome. I'd, yeah, I'll, I'll go to that. And yet the God of the universe every day says, well, why don't you come and talk with me? And we can't even pressure people into accepting the invitation. Why is that? Why is that so difficult? So that's what I want us to talk a bit about because I, there's, there's few things I hear more from people of prayer than that. Uh, I'm just burdened over the fact I cannot persuade other people of the need, the importance, the joy of talking to Almighty God. Uh, and so the question is, what impact is your prayer life having on others? Now, I uh, may have shared with some of you before, but uh, I had really uh, a landmark moment in my life about a year and a half ago. Because about a year and a half ago, uh, I became a grandparent. For the first time. Now, I know I look incredibly young to be a grandfather, but <laughs> I, I, I did indeed become a grandparent. Actually, uh, I went from no grandchildren whatsoever, and in 10 days, I had three grandsons. And they all live right by me, go to the same church. So I, I didn't even know where the nursery was in our church. Now I'm like the first adult there at the nursery every service when I'm in town. I'm just obnoxious. I don't even have one of those little papers they give you as the parent who drops the child off. I'm still absconding with infants out of the nursery every week anyway. But, uh, but you know, I, th at the time I thought, well, being a grandparent, it's, I'm not going to let that go to my head. It's, you know, that happens. It's not a big deal. I've, I've done lots of things in my life. I can handle that. I'm not going to be one of those obnoxious grandparents that just looks for an excuse to show them people, total strangers, dozens of pictures of all their grandchildren. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm not going to do that. Okay, you've got that, you've slipped, you pulled up my picture here. Uh, that's, this is my grandchildren here. Uh, go up, up, go back to that earlier picture there. Um, when I, uh, uh, so, you know, a year, year and a half or so ago, all of a sudden we get a call one Saturday morning. It's, it's coming down. We're going to the hospital. The, the twins are going to be born. And, uh, and I don't know what happened to me. Like, I've handled lots of stressful situations before. I've flown around the world. I've done lots of things. But, like, I just went brain dead all of a sudden. And, uh, I mean, I just, like, I, I, I couldn't believe it. Like, my wife and I had planned and talked through what we would do when the call came and who would get what and what we need to make sure we brought. And uh, three different times we just, I mean, we just, we ran to the car in the garage. Hurry, like, we got to go. And, and, uh, and then I forgot my wallet. And I had to run back in and get my wallet. And then we get back in the car and I forgot my keys. And I, I forgot my phone. I, like, three different times, I, like, we could have made a comedy routine out of just getting to get to the hospital. And then the car was out of gas. We didn't have enough to get there. 
and, uh, and then we, we hadn't had time to even have coffee that morning. I said, we're good. let this swing through the drive-in through and just get some coffee, at least on the way. And then they were all out. And they said, let's pull over. We'll bring it out to you in the parking lot when it's ready. And, and, uh, and so it's just and unbelievable how difficult it is just to get to the hospital in time. We finally, as we're pulling, we, we see the, the H above the, the hospital. And, uh, and my wife at this point is just frantic. And she said, Richard, don't, don't even park the car. Just, just pull up in the drop-off place. She said, those kids are going to be in kindergarten before I get there. Just let me out. One of us has got to get there. And so I swing up to the front door. She pulls out, runs in. Just, I mean, literally runs into the hospital. I'm starting to try to find a place to park. And then I see in my rearview mirror, I see my wife running back out of the hospital, flagging me down. And so I pull around, and just like, what do you need? She says, this is the wrong hospital. We've, I've literally dropped her off in the wrong hospital. I have a PhD. And I went completely stupid over two twin grandchildren. We've, we've, the, the actual hospital is, an hour, is about a mile and a half further down the road. This was like an auxiliary outlet place or something connected to them, but not the right one. So we, we get to the right hospital. This time I'm not dropping her off. I'm not giving her a head start. I'm getting there when she does. So we, we race into the maternity ward and we race up to the desk. I said, I'm Richard Blackaby. I've got twins being born here any second. Where are they? And I assume that, uh, you know, they'd want to scrub me up and get me in a gown or something. So I was all prepared. They said, uh, well, you need to go right over there. And I looked at this little waiting room. I said, Excuse me, you, you, clearly you did not hear what I said. I'm the grandfather. Where do you want me to be? They said, right over there. I, I found out later, I found out later that there's actually a bigger uh, waiting room where most of the normal people were waiting, but I think they, they didn't want me to go in there. I could infect them with something. And so they put me in this little room by myself. And my wife thought, well, there's no point of waiting in a waiting room when I could uh, be shopping down in the gift shop at least. So she takes off to do that. So I'm left all alone in this, this waiting room. There's a, a TV up mounted up on the wall. It's got 24-hour news going on. So I, I'm sitting there. That's all I've got to do. By the way, I, in my haste, I did forget my reading glasses. And I, I, I discovered a very important truth. Because the whole morning, I'm, I'm tweeting updates on the progress of these grandsons. But, I've, but have you ever cursed that autocorrect on... If you, if you ever use that, you, you type one word and it changes it to something else. And when you don't have your reading glasses, you don't know what it's changing it to. And you don't even know you've misspelled a word. It just is being changed. And so I'm sending the most bizarre tweets out into cyberspace. I've got people calling me saying, Richard, are you okay? Like, have you been kidnapped or something? Is someone using your phone to send bizarre messages? Like, uh, so I realized, do not ever send things out into... Uh, Cyberspace, when, when you have no reading glasses, you have no idea what you're saying. So I, I'm sitting there sending off these bizarre messages, watching the news. And of course, you know what is on 24-hour news channels? Seeing about who ISIS has beheaded, what suicide bomber, how many people they've just blown up at a wedding, uh, crime rates, murder rates, political divide, uh, angry animosity, uh, attacking one another, division, uh, and I'm watching this for probably 45 minutes. And, uh, and as I'm watching that, it begins to get my attention, and I just sense God saying, and this is the world that your two grandsons have just entered. And, and I just began, it's a very sobering moment, the, just the juxtaposition of these two beautiful, innocent little babies entering in the world, and then seeing what that world looked like. Well, eventually, they led us into the, the, my, my daughter-in-law's room, and one of, the, one of the twins was still in the nursery getting some extra attention, but there was now one live baby in that, in that room. And you, you must know, I love my wife, and I've been very good to her. I try to take good care of her, but I played a lot of sports, and I do know how to edge people out if I want to get to the, paw, the puck or the ball before they do. And I just very gently stepped in front of my wife, knocking her into a bedpan as I made my way to get that grandchild first. I, out of the three grandchildren born in that 10-day that period, I was the first adult besides their parents to hold all three of them. I held every one of them. My parents were there and we're all gathering around, but I grabbed that first child. I held him up. And I've just, for the last 45 minutes, 
been subjected to what this world is like. And as I'm looking at this beautiful, innocent little baby who has no idea what he's got facing him, God just said, and do you realize that pornography is going to spew its way through all the different airwaves and internet accesses to try to corrupt and destroy this little boy's mind? And he's going to go to school, and he's going to have friends who are going to mock the fact that he even believes that there's a God who exists. And he's going to go to school and have his faith in a creator God uh, laughed at and scorned. And when he tries to hold certain standards of purity and holiness, he's going to have everybody laugh at him and wonder why he's being so old-fashioned. And he's going to have a world that's going to come and try to desperately convince him that there is no God that he needs to live for himself just like the world does. And as I'm holding this beautiful little baby in my hands, that's, that was uh, the middle child in that picture is, the, the outside babies are the twins, and the middle, one is the, he was, the middle one was born that day. And so the twins came to see their new cousin. The twins are 10 days old, and they come to see the middle child that's, that was born that day. Um, but I'm holding one of those twins, and, uh, and as I'm holding that child... I just felt like God said, and so what kind of grandfather will this baby need so that when the world comes after him, the the influence of that godly grandfather holds him in place. And when people laugh at him and say, there is no God, my grandson can say, but if you'd ever heard my grandfather talk to God, you'd know there was a God. And when they mock his belief in God being involved or caring, would that grandchild say, but if you'd ever watched my grandfather pray and see the miracles that took place when he prays, you'd know there was a God. And what God was saying is, well, your prayer life convinced these little boys that God is real, that God loves them. Does, will your prayer life have any, any impact? Yeah, you can show that picture about a couple months later, the three grandsons came to watch a hockey game with me, and so that's, uh, that's I mean, it's amazing, you know, they're only a few months old, they immediately know what to do with the remote control. Isn't that, isn't that sad commentary, really, on, on children, but they've all got remote control, they're just a delight. Um, but uh, now we've got actually, the, the middle child has a brother on the way now, so I'm gonna have four grandsons as of January, all under two years old. Uh, but, uh, but you know what, when I, when I look at that, see a lot of times when, th- this is what's important I think for me. I've always believed in prayer. I've always believed prayer was important. But this put a face on why it's important. You know, sometimes you just say, well, we need to pray for revival. Well, you know, that's some, we do. But sometimes that kind of leaves you flat, doesn't it? Like, am I gonna get up early on a Saturday morning to pray for revival? Well, we should, but a lot of people won't. Will you get up early to pray for those kids? When you see those faces and you realize the the world, if, if the world does not change, if American society does not experience revival, by the time those boys are teenagers, can you imagine what kind of society America will have then? That's why you go to prayer conferences. That's why you get up early. That's why you're never satisfied with the current level of your prayer life because you realize it's not enough. Like, don't, you know, there's a lot of men especially say, well, I'm just not a prayer. Look at those kids and say, well, then learn how to pray. Don't look at those kids and say, sorry, Grandpa never prayed for you. I just wasn't a prayer. Well, learn how to pray. If you can learn how to follow sports statistics and know people's batting averages, Certainly you can open your Bible and say, God, teach me how to pray so that those kids at least have some kind of covering. We have the flimsiest excuses why we can't work it into our schedule to learn how to be an intercessor. But when I, when I saw them, God said, that's why you learn how to pray. And that's why you don't make excuses for not being a prayer. You learn how to pray. Because when those kids hit the, their school, when they start interacting with non-Christian kids and friends in the playground, they better know that they've got a grandfather who prays for them every day. And they've got to believe that when their grandfather prays, things happen. So the question for us in this hour is, does your prayer life have an influence? When you pray, does anyone else want to pray? I pray 
and hope that there'll be a day when those little boys come to me and say, Grandpa, tell us how you pray. How, how do you do that? How can I pray like you pray? I, I hope that my prayer life has that kind of influence. So I want you to look at a person this morning that uh, I, I, lately I was just reading through the book of Ezra. I, don't, I haven't read through that often, but that's where I was uh, recently. And, uh, and I was just struck by Ezra chapter 9. And so I want to just read uh, for you Ezra 9, and then just look at the influence, the impact of one person's prayer life. So Ezra 9, if you know the story of Ezra, he has grown up in Babylon. He, is, he was in the exile. It was his parents that uh, were living when Nebuchadnezzar had come and conquered Jerusalem, killed thousands of people, exiled, taken away the cream of the crop of Judean society, exiled them to Babylon. So Ezra has grown up in captivity because his parents failed to trust God. There's always a price to pay when we are not the men and women of God that we ought to be. Somebody suffers. And what God has convicted me is, we always are so self-centered. It's like, well, if I don't learn to pray, How will that affect me? Well, that's not even the best question. The question is, if you're not praying the way you ought to, how will it harm others? How will it harm your family? How will it harm your spouse? And uh, because Ezra's parents failed to trust God, Ezra grew up 900 miles away from from Jerusalem. He grew up in exile. But but eventually, as as Ezra now is is a man, Uh, He finds favor with this pagan emperor. The emperor of Persia is not a Christian. He's not a God-fearer. And yet, can God work through ungodly government leaders to accomplish his purposes? He can. Don't ever assume that you have to have a godly Christian in place for God to get his work done. God can use anybody. He used a number of pagan Persians uh, to get his work done. And God gives Ezra favor with Artaxerxes, the emperor of Persia, and and that emperor tells Ezra, you can go back, take back the treasures that belong to the temple, you can restore it. And so Ezra makes his pilgrimage back. Can you imagine his whole life has been spent almost a thousand miles away from his homeland, from the holy city, and as a grown man now, finally, never thinking he'd never be able to return, now he gets to go back. And can you imagine the excitement of the first time his eyes gaze upon Jerusalem? Even though the walls are nothing like they used to be, there's still rubble, there's still destruction, it's it's a shadow of what it once was, and yet when he comes back for the first time, he sees his homeland, and he he realizes, I'm going to get to spend the rest of my days in this place. And so he comes with great expectation. And you can imagine if, if you've assumed that you'd spend the rest of your life never able to go back to your home country. And now thousands of Jewish refugees return. Uh, the excitement they would have. But, but then notice it, in the beginning of, of chapter 9, the first thing you see is the problem. It says, when these things were done, The leaders came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons so that the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders... And the rulers has been foremost in this trespass. So what does is, what is the people do? They come and they say, now we're the special people of God. And why have the Jewish people spent the last 70 years in exile? Because they didn't act like a holy people. They didn't act differently than the world. And God said, if you're not going to be different than the world, there's no purpose for you. You might as well just be put in exile. You might as well be destroyed. And so for 70 years, they've suffered the consequences of not being willing to be a holy people. And now the next generation comes along, and God says, all right, your, your, your parents chose not to live holy lives. They've been destroyed. Now it's your opportunity 
to let me create a holy people that's different and that creates a holy seed. God's always, throughout the Old Testament, you see him constantly talking about raising up a godly seed. Children growing up loving God and their children growing up loving God and serving him. And so the leaders come to Ezra and they say, that's not happening. The Jewish people have returned to the, the Holy Land and they're just marrying pagans, people that don't believe in God at all, people that have other religions. And they're raising their children up in a confused home where they're not following the ways of God. They're not learning God's word. And, uh, the, and the children are growing up confused and uncertain of what's true and what religion they would have. And the worst thing is, they said that the leaders are the worst at this. The leaders are, instead of setting a godly example, they're embracing the world's ways even more fervently than the people at large. Um, you know, the problem with God's people is that we want to be special, but we don't want to be different. We want God to bless us, we just don't want to be holy. We, we want to live just like the world, pursuing all the things that the world pursues, but we also want God to bless us. And so there's no difference between us and society at large. And when a church looks just like society, you can't speak prophetically to it. You can't speak about the sins of society when all those same sins are rampant in the church. When, when, when you've got racism in the church, how does God use the church to address racism in society? When you've got materialism and the love of money in the church, how can we speak to a society that is obsessed with money and materialism outside the church? When, when we're divided and refuse to be reconciled in the church, how can we be an instrument of reconciliation outside the church? If we're not different than society, we have no purpose. We have no use to God. And what was happening, what they were saying to Ezra was, we're just eagerly trying to be just like society at large. We're not being a special people at all. We can't make any difference in society when we're just like them. And, uh, and folks, you know, it's, it almost seems archaic today to say that I, if, I, if you've got children or grandchildren, that the number one thing you're looking for is for them to marry a believer, a devout believer. Um, I hear some of the most ridiculous excuses for why that's not happening. I, I hear godly people say, I had one parent say, well, he's, uh, my, my daughter is dating someone, he's not a Christian, but at least he used to belong to a really bizarre cult, and at least he left that cult. As if, that, it's like, wow, that almost makes him a, like a, a next Billy Graham. He left a cult. He's, so, you're, so you're okay with that. I, I've heard the most nonsensical explanation. Well, he's a nice person. Folks, there's lots of atheists who are nice people. You don't want your granddaughter to marry one of them. Do you want... See, this is the problem. When we think it doesn't matter who our kids marry, what we're saying is we, we think it really doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. It doesn't really make a big difference. If you understood how radical of a difference it makes to be a follower of Jesus, you would understand there's absolutely no way you could be sold out 100% to Christ and then live and be married to someone who's not. It just doesn't work. I had some parents, it's just unbelievable, some things I've heard parents say. I had one set of parents, they had a beautiful little a young daughter. They said, well, and I found out she was dating someone who clearly was not a Christian, didn't even pretend to be. They said, yeah, well, that's, where we've kind of, that's how we've kind of worked out our rules. We've told her that she can date a non-believer, she just can't marry one. Now, is that, does, that, does that sound nonsensical to you? Most people that get married started out dating, didn't they? I said, why would you even have her date someone? Understand, when... Now, that, we think somehow we're putting people down because we don't want to marry them. I want to say, no, you and I just have completely different worlds, completely different standards, comp completely different loyalties. And we would be completely, uh, and I, I've talked to people who've been married to unbelievers for 40 years. And uh, it's, the, it's heartbreaking to hear 
year after year going to church by themselves, year after year watching them try to teach godliness to their kids and the unbeliever being spouse mocking those same teachings and telling the kids, forget what your mother says. Um, that's what they were coming to Ezra and saying. These people are treating the fact that they belong to God as if it doesn't even matter. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times uh, people will come and look at our family and say, well, it's amazing that all of your, all of your siblings are in ministry and all, all the grandkids are Christians and um, you're, you're just really fortunate. And I'd say, well, we are fortunate. We are blessed. But you know what? We also were very careful about who our kids marry. And we didn't let them date people that, that were not believers. And, and even people that weren't strong Christians, we, we steered them away. We said, there's just too much at stake. God's looking for a godly seed, and we take that seriously. And so, so that's the issue that they bring to Ezra. They, they said, Here's, we're getting a second chance to be a special people of God, and we're just we're throwing it away. We're, we're treating it as if it, it matters not at all. And so what I want you to see is Ezra's response. So that's the problem. People come and say there's this compromise in the people of God. The people of God are not setting any higher standard. And so notice in verse 3 it says, um, So when I heard this thing, so how does Ezra respond? He says, I tore my garment and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard and sat down astonished. I'll tell you what, that, what do you think of that response? Uh, tore out his hair, tore his clothes, sat in the ground just astonished. Couldn't believe it that God's people would act that way. Um, it's interesting, by the way, if you compare Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, there's a lot of similarities. They kind of overlap. Uh, in, uh, actually, in the last chapter, about chapter 13 of Nehemiah, around verse 25, the same issue takes place, and Nehemiah addresses that. The difference, by the way, they both pull out hair. The difference is Nehemiah pulls out other people's hair. <laughs> of course, Nehemiah is a government leader, and he's so upset with people, he actually goes and hits them and pulls out their hair to make them stop. Ezra pulls out his own hair. Uh, maybe Ezra had more hair to, to, to lose or something, but... Uh, but I think it's interesting, the difference. Nehemiah is a government leader. He's got power. He, he has the ability to tell people what to do. Ezra does. What does Ezra have? He has the, the, the ability to pray. He has the ability to cry out to God, to humble himself. And so that's what he does. He doesn't have the right to pull out other people's hair, so he doesn't. But he, he, he can respond for himself. So he sits down astonished. It says, at the evening sacrifice. So in other words, he's been sitting astonished now for some time. I arose from my fasting, and having torn my garment and my robe, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. Uh, he's he's going to pray, right? That's, that's his response. He's heartbroken over a society, a God's people. It's, it's one thing, and that's the thing that you find in the Bible. The Bible is never shocked when, un, when unbelievers act like unbelievers, right? The Bible never is bewildered by that. The, the Bible expects that. What's always a problem is, is when God's people act like unbelievers. That's always the issue. That's why God says in 2 Chronicles, if my people will turn from their wicked ways. The Bible never says if, if, if unbelievers turn from their wicked ways, revival will come. God always says it's my people that are acting just like the world, if they would stop doing that, then revival would come. And so Ezra is shocked at what God's people are doing, not at what ungodly people are doing. So he falls to his knees and he prays. And notice what he prays. He says, and I, and I, and I said, oh my God, I'm too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Do you notice what he's saying? Now, is Ezra married to a godly woman? As far as we know, he is. He's not compromised. He's not committed a sin. So why does he use the word our? Our sins. Shouldn't he be praying, God, forgive their sins. Forgive those who are sinners in this society. Forgive the government for, for the leadership, for its moral compromise. But what does he say? It's our sin. 
You see, I think that's also a key to revival. As long as you pray, oh God, forgive them, revival is still distant. When you start praying, God, forgive us, identify. I think, what, I think that's one of the, re, the problems with the church today, and I'll just confess, I think that I would identify with this. Because when I look on the news and I see the deprivation and the, and the immorality and the violence and the lack of concern for human dignity and life, it appalls me at what other people can act like. Like, I would never cut someone's head off. I, I would never shoot someone because of the color of their skin. So I, to me, I look at what other people do, and I'm appalled at what they would do. But that, that's not necessarily going to bring revival by pointing an accusing finger at other people, other government leaders, and be appalled at, God, would you just fix them? The revival praying that's always made a difference, Daniel praying, uh, Moses praying, Ezra praying, is when he realizes, no, that's me. That's, that's my people. That's my nation. I'm an, um, Americans are doing this. I'm an American. That's my, that's my country that is sinning and acting so appallingly before a holy God. And so Ezra says, our, our sins have risen. He doesn't separate that and say, I just can't believe how some people can act. He says, that's, that's me. That's, that's my sin. That's always the most powerful praying for revival. And uh, he goes on to say, since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty. And for our iniquities, we, our kings, our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation as it is to this day. He says, what does Ezra do? When he looks at where society is today, what does he do? He looks back to the beginning of the nation. And he says, from the time of our fathers until now. No wonder the sins are above his head. How many sins? So if you were to look at America and, and say, God, show me the sins of America, not just from today, not just from 2016, but since the beginning of this nation, would, would that not overwhelm you? Would that not cause you to fall to your knees in shock? and sit there not even knowing how to respond. You see, I, what, I, what I realize is I don't know that my response to the condition of the nation is anywhere like Ezra's yet. I get indignant at other people. I wish other, God would deal with other people. But I don't fall to my knees in shock and say, this is, that's my people. That's my nation. That's us. And what Ezra is saying is, we have already suffered so much, the judgment of God, because of this sin. And God's given us a respite. He's given us a, a, a moment of grace where he's allowed us to return from exile. He's giving us a second chance, and we're blowing that second chance. And if we would blow this opportunity, God's judgment surely will come again. And are we ready for what God does next? Of course, ultimately, God destroyed Jerusalem and for almost 2,000 years. The Jewish people were gone. They'd been gone 70 years the, the first time. They'd be gone 2,000 years the next time. Ezra understood what was at stake. If we don't get this right, judgment is coming. And it drove him to his knees in astonishment that after all that God had done, the people would be so quick to just embrace everything that the world had seduced them with the last time. And here God's people were going to do the very same thing again. And so he prays. And notice this, in verse 9, he says, For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments. He's saying, we knew what God wanted us to do, and we've rejected it again. We've, just, we, we've barely returned from the last, the exile that was God's last punishment for us, and we're already sinning just as fervently as what caused us to be judged the last time. And Ezra is saying, oh God, what does it take to get through to people that sin brings death? Sin brings judgment. And so he's praying, and he's, and he's spelling this out, and, the, and what's interesting is it, the context tells us Ezra is praying this publicly. People are listening to him pray. 
This isn't a private prayer closet. Would you be willing to pray like this so that others heard what you were saying? He's, his prayer is going to have an impact. Uh, and he's laying it out there to God. He's pouring his heart out. He's not holding anything back. And, uh, and it's interesting, just uh, a couple other things just to point out in this prayer. Uh, verse 12, Now, therefore, do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and this is, this is what God's word was to them. And, and leave it as an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Now, what, what, is this, what has Ezra just done? He's just grown up in exile because of God's judgment. But, but Ezra is saying, we got off light. If God had given us what we deserve, we'd be annihilated. And folks, could we not say that about America? If God were to give America what it deserves for the blasphemy that is spewed out on the airwaves, government leaders making a mockery of God's word, uh, I don't have to go down the litany of reasons why we've gotten off easy. If God were to judge us for what we deserve. And Ezra is saying, God is so gracious that he could have done so much more. And he will if we don't repent. He's saying, after all that God has shown us in grace, how could we not, how could we just turn around and continue living just like the world? And he says, after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve, should we again break your commandments and uh, join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us so that there was no remnant or survival. O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant as it is this day. Here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. Take time to read Ezra 9 and see what kind of revival praying Ezra did. Ezra is in shock at what he sees. His response is to pray. Now he prays in a, publicly, he pray, prays corporately, but he's not really preaching, although it's a pretty powerful message, isn't it? Uh, I'll tell you what, some of the most powerful preaching you ever hear is when someone is crying out to God on behalf of others. Um, all he's doing is, he's just praying. He's not preaching, he's not giving a theological discourse, he's just talking to God. So the problem is God's people are compromising themselves. Ezra's response is he's praying, pouring his heart out, but then notice the result. Verse 1 of chapter 10. Now while Ezra was praying and while he was confessing, weeping, and bowing down before the house of God, a very large assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel, for the people wept very bitterly. As I was reading through this the other day, I thought to myself, does a large crowd of people gather and weep when they hear me pray. When I'm praying, what impact does my prayer life have on others? When Ezra prayed, a crowd gathered. When Ezra prayed, people began to weep. You notice, not just the men, but the women and even the children. Even, in other words, the young people were attracted to that kind of praying. They knew something unusual was taking place. And they had to come there, and they were overcome by what they heard. And, uh, and as, I, as I looked at that, I thought to myself, and yet there's so many of us that are praying and no one wants to join us. We say, oh, we'll be meeting to pray on Friday morning. You're welcome to come join us and no one shows up. And so I want to say, well, yeah, that's a reflection, I'm sure, of the people who choose not to come. Could it also be a reflection of my prayer life? Perhaps the way I'm praying is not drawing people either. The way I cry out to God is not compelling to other people. My own, my own children don't want to join me to pray the way I have been praying. But Ezra was so shaken. Ezra cried out from the depths of his soul in such a way that by the time he's finished praying, he looks up and there's a crowd of people all drawn to say, 
he's speaking truth. If you continue to read, what happens is the people begin to renounce their marriages to unbelievers and Gentiles and to, set, to, 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 to cleanse their families. And basically, revival takes place because a man was heartbroken enough and he cried out in prayer in such a way that God heard and the people responded. My question to you is, so what is happening when you pray? When I, and I, I say this very carefully because I realize that there are, there are Jeremiah's who cry out in the wilderness for years and don't see much response. But when someone says, I've been praying for 40 years for my church and 40 years later, it's, everything's the same. It, it could just be you're in a very hard-hearted, cold church. Or maybe that if you've been doing, uh, praying the same way for 40 years, maybe you need to get alongside some people like Ezra and say, God, do you need to take my praying to a different place? Do I need to pray in a different way, a different level? Because there's no one gathering. I get no, not even one person comes and wants to pray after I pray. Ezra, there's a whole crowd of people afterward. I remember when I came to my church as a pastor, it was a very dysfunctional, broken church. Uh, they, uh, uh, it, it had been declining for seven straight years. It was uh, just kind of a ghost town. Uh, the former pastor had uh, committed adultery in that church. The a pastor right before me had had a nervous breakdown. Things were so, so bad in that church. Um, th there had been a knife incident in the church lobby. <laughs> I think that was between two deacons, but <laughs> there, was a, there was a knife incident. There was a, the, the church treasurer had embezzled a bunch of money from the church funds. And when I arrived at that church the night before my first service, uh, a fellow pastor stopped by and he, just unannounced, he just showed up at my house. And he said, so your first Sunday tomorrow, I said, I know your church. He said, I'll tell you, I would not touch your church with a 10-foot pole. So I knew then this man did not have the gift of encouragement. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, and so I thought, I'm, that was my first pastorate. I'm, I'm still in my 20s. Uh, I don't know what to do. And so I just... All I need to do is I've got to start praying. Now, I, I worked. I, mean, I, I, I tried to preach. I tried to do other things. But I knew we had to pray. And so I remember uh, gathering this little handful of people on a, for a prayer meeting, mostly my, the leaders. And uh, I remember at one point saying, uh, who's, who sees what God is doing uh, in the church? And, and one person said, well, there was just a small the tennis was quite low last week. There wasn't, the giving was really low last week, and there were no decisions made last week. God wasn't doing anything. I said, no, you, you didn't see what God was doing? They said, no, what, what was he doing, Pastor? I said, well, did you notice uh, the one woman sitting in the very front row? Uh, she had her hands up in the service, and someone said, yeah, she, I noticed her. She, she, had, she was, seemed so joyful. She smiled through the whole service. I said, do you realize that two months ago she tried to commit suicide? And uh, God got a hold of her and saved her life, and God has so transformed her and given her hope and joy that now she's the most joyful person in the whole room. I said, that was God that did that. And I said, did, you, did anyone notice young Michael in the service? He's a teenage boy, about 15, and someone said, yeah, I, I was sitting behind him. He was sitting between his parents. Uh, they said, I thought it was interesting, this 15-year-old boy, he was holding his mother's hand through the whole service. I said, do you remember what, uh, what happened to him? And uh, someone said, yeah, he, he, he ran away from home about a month ago. He, he got in trouble at school. The principal called his dad to come down. The boy got scared and, and ran away from home. Well, the police were out looking for him. The prayer chain was praying for him. Uh, his whole family was in disarray. And... and the church came around him. The church prayed for that family. And what was he doing on Sunday? He was in church holding his mother's hand through the whole worship service. I said, do you understand? We prayed that boy back into the church, back into his family. And I said, uh, did anyone notice uh, Rob at the, at the back of the auditorium? And someone said, yeah, his wife was a new believer in our church, but her husband was not, had not yet been uh, born again. And uh, and this woman was just on fire for Jesus, and her husband got so upset, he, he made a declaration. He said, I just think you've gone crazy over this Jesus stuff. And he said, I'm, you can keep going to church if you want, but I'm not going back there again. 
I, I just think those people are a bunch of lunatics, and uh, I'm not going to have anything to do with them. I, I said, where, where has that guy been the last three Sundays? He's been in church with his wife. He declared he was never going back, but he's been there the last three Sundays. Why do you think that is? Because we've been praying him to Jesus. And he can't even resist. He, can't even, he doesn't even know what's happening. He can't stay away. He keeps swearing he'll never come back, and then he shows up. Why is that? It's because we're praying. So let's keep praying. You know what began to happen in that little group of people praying? We, they got excited because they were, we weren't just saying prayers and then nothing was happening. We were praying and God was moving. Heaven was making a difference. And uh, we started a prayer time on Friday mornings at our church from 6 till 7. And uh, first we just had a handful of people. You know, and you say, who wants to join me at 6 o'clock on Friday morning to pray? You don't know if anyone's going to show up. I didn't say we can go for breakfast afterward, and that helped. You throw food into the mix, that often gets more people excited than prayer does. But, uh, but we had a, a group of people come, and I'll never forget, uh, it, it began to grow, and, and we began to get a, a good group of people every Friday morning. And the focus was on the services on Sunday. Let's just pray that God will work, and we would call people by name and victories that needed to be won, and we'd say, let's pray for it, and then let's, let's watch on Sunday and watch and see what God does. Don't just pray. That's one of the reasons why people don't want to come to prayer meetings. We, we say prayers, and then we walk away and never make any connection with what happens next. But that's boring. What's exciting is praying on Friday, and then everybody coming with their eyes open Sunday to watch those prayers work themselves out in people's lives. And you pray for someone's salvation, and at the end of the service, you see that person praying with the pastor to receive Christ, and everybody that was in that prayer meeting says, prayer did it again. We prayed, and God worked. And uh, so let's get together and pray next week. Who, who else do we need to pray into the kingdom and into salvation? And, and th that, that marriage that's about to end in divorce, let's pray until we see that couple worshiping together, sitting next to each other in church once again. We can do that. And when you look over, and there's that couple praying in church that were about to, to be divorced. Everybody in that room says, God told us to pray, and look what happened. He saved a marriage. Let's keep praying. And that little group of people, we began to see praying Friday and then Sunday morning, lo and behold, God would do stuff. And I'll never forget one Friday morning, we prayed. And you know, sometimes you pray, God just sort of puts over your heart this sense, God's going to do something. And I mean, I, I can't explain it to you, except that when we finished praying, uh, and we've been praying for several years now, but that, that Friday morning, we looked at everybody that had prayed that day just sensed, I can hardly wait till Sunday. Have you ever been there where you pray and you just know God's given you an assurance? He is going to answer. Just, just get there early. And so we, on Sunday morning, it was just an ordinary Sunday. No special meetings, no special advertising, just a typical Sunday. But out of the blue, cars just kept pulling into the parking lot. Visitors kept coming. People who hadn't been there in months just chose to show up, and the ushers are having to go and get other chairs and put chairs out in the lobby and along the sides of the, and it's like, what on earth? Where are all these people coming from? And everybody that had been in that prayer time on Friday, it's funny, we, have a little, we had a little greeting time at that point, and we had this one guy, he's real young, in his 20s, that was praying with us. He sang in the choir, and uh, when we had the greeting time, he rushes down from the choir loft and he says, we knew this was going to happen. Everybody there on Friday knew that God was going to work. Look at what he did. He said, and he always would say, I'm pumped. He said, I'm pumped. He's so excited. I said, isn't it awesome? Well, the very, so I'll tell you what, next Friday morning, I'll tell you what, everybody was there ready to pray at 6 o'clock. And uh, it was exciting because when we prayed, stuff happened. And so we prayed, and again, we have this sense that, uh, oh, it's, it's going to be another great Sunday. We just, we sense it. God is, is, is telling us, I've heard your prayers. I'm going to respond. And so, uh, I mean, literally, we, we, everybody's getting, all the prayers are getting there early. I mean, I literally, it got to the point that I would have people coming into the church looking at me saying, Pastor, anything happened yet? Because they just knew we'd been praying and we were expecting. And uh, so that's, so the very next Sunday after we had to pull chairs out everywhere, uh, we've got all the chairs ready to pull out once again. Now they're all stacked, ready to bring in as we need them. And uh, attendance is actually kind of down that week. We, don't, we never have to pull out the extra chairs. And uh, we're kind of bewildered. because. And so at the greet time, that same 20-year-old comes over to me 
And he says, Pastor, what's going on? We, we sense God was going to work. Where is everybody? He said, did we get it wrong last week? I said, well, the, the, the day's not over yet. <laughs> let, let, God, let God do what he's going to do. And uh, so we go through the service. Everything seems kind of normal. That week we had an altar call uh, at the end of the service. We had eight people come up and pray to receive Christ and ask to be baptized. And I looked over at my 20-year-old, and he said, I'm pumped, Pastor, I'm pumped. God did it again. And I said, don't, don't put God in a box. We, we don't tell God what to do. We just cry out to God, and then we just watch with anticipation. And when God acts, we point a finger and say, all the glory goes to God. He did it again. Uh, see, that, that's exciting praying, is it not? We met at 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock for prayer. I never had to announce it. I never had to get up and urge people, come and join us. Word got out. The most exciting thing you do is go and pray, and then you watch God go to work and do stuff. And folks, I'm telling you, don't be content to say, I guess I'm the lone prayer in my church. I guess I'm just that lone voice crying in the wilderness. No one else wants to pray. Don't be satisfied with that. Don't be content with that. Say, then, God, do you need to do something in my prayer life so that when I pray, a crowd gathers and people say, okay, can we get in on what you're doing? And when you pray and God answers, you cry out not to brag about what a great prayer you are, but to just celebrate the goodness of God. We prayed, and look what God did. And you start telling that story, and others want to get in on answered prayer. And they, well, when are you meeting? Maybe I should join you. Come on and join in on what God's doing. And before you know it, you've you got to get a bigger room to fit all the people in. We, we actually got to a point in our Friday morning prayer times when we first started to meet. We just had a little group of people. We'd all kneel. We actually went up and knelt at the front of the church, the platform is where we would pray. And just anyone who wanted to pray would pray. We had a whole hour. But we got to the point where there was too many of us to all just pray. We had to divide into two and say, okay, just for time's sake, we only have an hour. Let's divide this 6 o'clock prayer time into two groups so that we, everybody can have enough time to pray. I thought to myself, when we're having problems, we got too many people showing up at 6 in the morning to pray uh, maybe there's words getting out that God's up to something. Because I'm telling you, I, 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 people will meet at 5 in the morning. People will meet in the middle of the night. People will go up on top of mountains. They'll go anywhere to pray where they sense this is real prayer. And when they pray, mountains move. But they won't go into an air-conditioned, fully uh, furnished, comfortable uh, little meeting room to pray if they sense there's no power there. Read over Exodus or Ezra 9 and see how Ezra prayed. And then read verse 1 of chapter 10 and see what happened when he was done. A crowd had gathered, and they said, we want in on what you're doing. When you prayed, when we heard what was on your heart, we, we were moved. Uh, too many of us are praying, and people afterward are bored by what they heard. People should never be bored listening to you pray. Because you're talking to all. If you're praying in a way that appears boring, you don't know how to pray yet, even if you think you do. When biblical people prayed, angels were dispatched. Crowds gathered. Things changed. That biblical praying is attractive. So let's stop bemoaning the fact people aren't interested in prayer and say maybe they've not yet encountered the kind of prayer that Ezra and Daniel and Moses and Jesus prayed. Because when Jesus prayed, his own disciples came and said, teach us to talk to God like you do. Because we've never heard anybody. If that is what prayer is, we want to pray. So can I, I don't mean to lay a guilt trip on you. I just, I just hear too many godly, faithful people who just resign themselves to the fact that there'll always be a tiny little remnant of people that are never joined by very many other prayers. And I want to say, don't, don't settle for that. Don't assume that that's how it has to be. Uh, and it doesn't mean that, you know, next week you come in with a tambourine in each hand while you pray to shake things up. Just, but ask, get around these great prayers and say, oh God, am I praying like that yet? Am I praying in such a way that from the depths of my heart, people are moved by what they hear? They hear a soul that's crying out to God. And you know, even as you hear the person pray, that God is listening to that kind of prayer, and God's going to work. Um, 
That's the kind of praying we want to do. And I'll tell you what, if every one of us prays like that, our kids and grandkids are going to want to be drawing near to that kind of prayer. And people in our church are going to want to draw near. Even people in the community that may not be believers are going to want you to pray for them if that is how you pray. Is that, is that how you're known? Well, we're going to...